happy to have the face of Young India in front of you. This is Abhishek. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. And this young lad here, whom I am so proud to present to you, is Rohan. Hello all. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to India. I just found out this morning, just two months ago, he got the award from no other than the President of India for his work. So now that you are all sufficiently curious, and the person who is really helping him is Abhishek. So without further ado, I pass it to Satya to make the introductions and start the meeting. Thanks, Satya. Uh, well, you already had the introductions of sorts. Uh, I think importantly, I wanted this to happen because I felt that uh, you know India's aerospace and defense is a sector that is very exciting today. We have Abhishek, who's literally a pioneer in this uh, area, so appropriately called new space. So over to Abhishek, to you, to share with us, is India's space sector so far removed from these realities of India, or is it really part of the solution set? Well, it is part of the so solution. So that would be so a yes. <laughs> interesting, <laughs> okay, interesting just to lead in. the dots, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I come from the space industry. I've been in the space industry for the last five years. Uh, that's not too much time, uh, but we uh, started India's first uh, private space company, uh, which focuses on building satellites and building, you know, earth stations and things like that. Rohan here uh, is is building uh, thrusters and propulsion systems and and rockets, uh, small satellite launch vehicles actually. Uh, so. So that means you're a genius in math and physics. N not really. <laughs> so uh, I have a background in sociology. I did my bachelor's in sociology, uh, and post that I've worked in a couple of companies. I worked. I started my career in in intellectual property law. Uh, moved on to uh, the insurance com in industry, where I was uh, working in you know various functions of uh, corporate functions of insurance, and then I moved on to contract management at uh, GE, where I was handling like a big uh, energy portfolio, a contract portfolio. And post that, uh, you know, I've ha I had enough of, uh, you know, working for large corporates. And uh, the startup bug, uh, you know, bit me, like it bit a lot of people uh, my age uh, when I started off. So when I did start, I was 28. Uh, I, when I co-founded my first company called as Druva Space. Uh, prior to that, I kind of spent a lot of time playing around, uh, you know, uh, I call it playing around because I didn't do anything serious. Uh, I was working with startups. I didn't really have a role. I didn't really have a role definition. I would do anything and everything. So uh, I would uh, call myself uh, a startup's best friend. So you know, you want something, just give me a give me a shout, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, so I started off that way. So I had a little bit of experience working with startups, not my own, uh, but, but but other startups. I very accidentally got into the space industry. So it was uh, in a ham radio club. Uh, I don't know how many of you know of ham radios. Mm -hmm. You're from the internet generation, I guess, <laughs> so you may not have heard of ham radios. So it's a radio club. Uh, back in the day when the internet was not around, uh, you know, people would you know build their own little radios uh, and and talk to each other from across the globe. Morse code, Morse code is one of them, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, I was in a ham radio club. Uh, yes, those still exist all over the world. Uh, although you know the number of people uh, pursuing uh, ham radio is very very small now. Uh, I was in a ham radio club where I, you know, bumped into uh, two of my other co-founders uh, who had just got back from uh, their masters uh, from Europe. So they did the Erasmus Space Master program. Uh, so that's basically like a, a two-year program where every six months they go to a different university in a different country in Europe. Uh, they do both space science and space technology. So these guys. Both of them had come back uh, to India after their space program, uh, space master program. You know, we, we met each other and, you know, we decided to, to start India's first private satellite manufacturing company called Dhruva Space. So this was in 2012. Uh, that's, that's how it all started. So sociology to space. Sociology to space. Very natural progression, I presume. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I did have to learn a little bit of uh, space technology, uh, but you know it's not difficult. Uh, like I was uh, <laughs> telling Divya, space uh, being a rocket scientist is overrated. So, <laughs> rocket science is not really that. Are you telling me he's no overrated? Offense. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. No offense, buddy. <laughs> 
So that's how it all started. And, uh, you know, one company to another. In fact, uh, just to uh, give you an update, as of last week, uh, Dhruva Space uh, was acquired by another space company. And uh, that would also be India's first private space acquisition. So uh, congratulations. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, of course, it's, it's still underway. Uh, we're not fully integrated yet, uh, but... Uh, but it's announced it's public. It's announced it's public. It's very interesting that you would say that you met your co-founders through what you did when you were young, because um, a big question in entrepreneurship is, how do you meet your team? How do you make your team? You know? Well, it was just serendipitous, right? It was, it was never planned. I, I didn't know them before. Uh, it was just, you know, common interest that kind of brought us to the same place at the same time. Right? I mean, if I was not attending that software-defined radio course, uh, it was actually a class uh, where I was a student, and these guys were there to actually, uh, as, 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 as faculty members, uh, teaching uh, the class on, on, on building radios. And uh, we just happened to be at the, at the right place at the right time. So, but then we took it forward. You know, it was not just that, okay, we met and we exchanged cards, and we didn't exchange cards. We don't. Uh, we generally don't. It's very informal out here in India. Uh, so we just met and we, we hit it off, uh, you know, we had a nice connect with each other and uh, we kind of stayed in touch, uh, ha started having conversations uh, without knowing where it would all lead to and it, it did lead to uh, us starting this company. Uh, first of all, you need to remember this, space industry is highly regulated no matter where you go in the world. Right, it's uh, just like defense. Uh, it's it's highly and aerospace. It's highly regulated uh, because of many reasons. Uh, there are lots of uh, you know international treaties that that uh, you know uh, basically cover space uh, and and usage of space. Uh, space can be, if not regulated, can be used for uh, destructive purposes. Uh, space, by the way, is 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 commons for all of us, right? Uh, there are treaties that prevent us, any of us, from across the world to use it for, uh, for purposes of war. Uh, for, uh, you know, we cannot weaponize space. Uh, you know, that's, that's how it is. You know, space is common for the good of people. So, because it is regulated and because we were the first company, the government didn't really know what to do with us. <laughs> They're like, okay, now we've never, I mean, you come to us, you, you say you want to build satellites. We had built satellites. By the way, my co-founder Sanjay, he built India's first student satellite while he was still in uh, grad school. And uh, yeah, so, you know, he did have experience building satellites in India. Uh, and then with that experience, he kind of, you know, went ahead and did the Space student Master. Student satellite means they do it when they're... When they're, in, when, they're, when they're studying their engineering program. And there are a lot of student uh, satellite programs currently ongoing, actually. Uh, but he, he was part of the first mission uh, in India. He did have that experience. Uh, people knew that, you know, there are young people building satellites. You know, they know how things work and uh, they are exposed to space technology. Not everybody is joining the Indian space program, right? By the way, uh, do you know what the Indian space program is called? ISRO. Okay. Do you know, uh, what it's, you know what it stands for? research organization. Yes, not very complicated. <laughs> okay, uh, how many of you have heard of ESA? ESA is the European Space Agency. And how many of you have heard of uh, DLR? Most countries have. Uh, a lot of developing countries are aspiring to be in the space, uh, you know, uh, have their own space industry. Uh, Right now, there are over 80 countries in the world that actually don't have an active space program. So there were all these students uh, building satellites while they were still in college, and they would all not get uh, you know, absorbed into the space program because uh, just to get into the Indian space program, one, it's highly competitive, uh, two, it's a government job, so to speak, right? And it's highly coveted. You know, people want to get in there, and once they get in, they never get out. It, there are very few openings that come about. So uh, these, so we now have a few hundred uh, students uh, who are exposed to space technology, who probably went out uh, uh, and did a masters in space and space technologies and things like that. And because it's all highly highly regulated, right? As an Indian, right? Uh, I cannot get into NASA because obviously you need to be a green card holder or uh, you need to be a citizen. Uh, the same thing applies in, in in different parts of Europe as well. Unless you're a you belong to a certain nationality, you cannot get into a certain space agency of, of that particular nation. 
So uh, because of those restrictions, uh, most people who go out to study space technology come back to India. And when they do come back, the only other option they're left with uh, besides joining uh, a traditional company doing something non-space related, is to start something on their own. Uh, just like how my two co-founders started, the, there are quite a few companies today, you know, emerging, so to speak, uh, very early stages. Uh, so there are all these companies that, 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 that are there today. But when we started in 2012, the government did not really know what to do with us. Or, uh, you know, how, I mean, do we, uh, are we a regulated entity? Uh, what kind of permissions do we need to take from the government? What kind of permissions do we need to take from the space agency? Uh, and if you see, space as a subject matter is directly under the prime minister's office uh, because of the strategic nature it has, right? Uh, both uh, you know, uh, atomic energy and space are with the prime minister. That's his portfolio. And you can imagine, I mean, if it's a portfolio of the prime minister, uh, you can never get there. It's very, very difficult. Uh, we are a big country, uh, a <coughs> really big country. So unlike, uh, I mean, you could probably uh, walk up to the chancellor in, 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 uh, in Switzerland or Germany, but not in, not in India. In the, you can never meet the prime minister unless, uh, unless you're like him who got an award for, uh, <laughs> for the accomplishment. That is post the accomplishment. Early stages, uh, so we, were, we, were, we started off on a gray zone. Uh, we didn't know what to do. Uh, we didn't have any money uh, because, first of all, space technology, investing in space technology is expensive, right? Uh, in order to build a satellite, it could be in the range of one and five million dollars, right? Uh, a small satellite of our class, the ones that we target to build. We didn't have money and there is no, uh, you know, the VC community does not understand the space business because traditionally, you know, if you have an option between an e-commerce and, and, and space, Rather, rather go to e-commerce because you know you have revenues from day one. You don't have a gestation period of you know you don't have to wait around till you build your satellite or put it up in orbit uh, and so on and so forth. The risks are lower. Uh, you know traction is much higher in in in, uh, in in e-commerce. So the traditional Indian investors were were completely closed to investing in space, right? So we were not we were not really deterred by that. Uh, we wanted to still go ahead and build something and do something, and. Uh, so the option we thought that would work was build partnerships, right? We started building partnerships from across the globe. Uh, we have a company, we have a partner company in, uh, in, in, in Germany called as Berlin Space Technologies, based out of Berlin. Uh, we partnered with various companies in the US. Uh, we partnered with a few companies here in India, uh, companies that already had the infrastructure uh, to, to do stuff, companies that were traditionally in aerospace, that could be, re you know, whose infrastructure could be repurposed for the space industry and things like that. So we started forming all these partnerships and uh, we started doing business, uh, you know, the, 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 the caveman way. You know, we started bartering stuff. We said, hey, why don't you give us your facility in exchange for that, we give you market access. We, you know, make you part of an ecosystem or we make you part of a, 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 of a program where when we do make profits, we kind of, you know, you know share that with you. Or you know, you give us these components, and we give you some other components that we have that we don't need. So we started doing all these barter deals uh, with companies, which, which is quite new, right? It, it's not how traditionally things are done. Right. Uh, so we did overcome that barrier, and we did build our first satellite, which is so totally bootstrapped. Is that right? That's right. So <laughs> Druva Space was totally bootstrapped. Uh, it still is uh, until it got acquired. So now. <laughs> So Drua Space, over five years, uh, you know, of course, things went in different directions. We went wherever we saw there was money, right? Because we didn't really have an option. Uh, so we did services. Uh, so we built India's, uh, we, we built a, a high altitude platform uh, for testing payloads. So what it essentially does is, uh, how many of you know the stratosphere? Stratosphere is considered near space, right? Uh, it is right at the edge of the atmosphere. I mean, that's where things end and space begins. So we built uh, a platform that would take payloads uh, from Earth to the stratosphere, to the edge of stratosphere to test it. We did successful experiments. So essentially what it, what it does is it's just a little, you know, uh, payload box uh, fitted to uh, helium balloons that can fly uh, all the way up to 40 kilometers, 30, between 35 and 40 kilometers in altitude from, from the Earth. So just to give you perspective, when you fly in a plane, uh, when, it's when it's cruising in maximum altitude, it's about eight, 10 kilometers. So we're talking about 40 kilometers, right? So uh, even, even fighter jets are maybe, I think. 17. 17 kilometers. So this is 40 kilometers, like really, really up there. 
uh, the conditions are really uh, it's it's space like it's it's almost space right uh, uh, just to add a word at 40 kilometers i think uh, you will come to know that the earth is round so many people still believe earth is flat <laughs> 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 just to have a proof you need not go to space just go to 40 kilometers you can see the curvature <laughs> okay so yeah so we started building those and uh, Question: Did you have to get? Per I mean, you, you, it was it difficult to get the permissions? Yes, very difficult, <laughs> very very difficult. So, see, we have what is called as DGCA, <coughs> right? Uh, it's the aviation regulator in the country, right? And uh, they are very very they're very particular. I mean, it's it's air, it, it's aviation, right? You cannot send a balloon and it cannot go and hit an airplane that's flying, and that could be disastrous. You don't want something like that happening. So they would give us permission. First of all, it, it would take us six months to get permission to make one test flight. And uh, so we'd work six months back, you know, you know, kind of plan this out, uh, you know, then, you know, go to the regulators, file in our application. They would know, want to know what is, what are you flying? You don't want to be flying, you know, payloads that will image sensitive areas and you don't want to sell it to the terrorists and things like that, right? I mean, they want to prevent from all that. So they wanted to know who the client is, why are you flying these payloads, what is in there? What does it do? So on and so forth. We had to give a lot of explanations. Uh, post that, they would, they would take their own sweet time uh, and then give us permission. And they would say, OK, you have time between 3 AM and 5.30 AM on some random Sunday when it's, called, when it's actually a no-fly uh, time for the rest of the planes. You can only fly during that time. Is it expensive to get such a permission? Not, it's not so much about uh, expense. You just need to file a lot of paperwork. Uh, so initially, we had to make a couple of trips to Delhi, uh, but then you know, once we figured out the whole process, it was not so complicated. It's just a lot of paperwork, you know, explaining what are we, what are we flying, when are we flying, who are we flying it for, and things like that. We had to get like end user certificates and things like that, uh, so that you know they know who it is for. But, 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 but talking still about the financing of that part of thing, I mean, it's still you know, I mean, when, when you say it's a million or something like this to to, to get this up. I mean, that's not only going to be, hey, I give you two spare parts and I give you some office space. I mean, at the end of the day, you still need so, some money, right? Yes, and, yes. And so, so that's how we earned our money, by, by building these uh, platforms. Uh, okay. And we were, uh, we were contractors to uh, the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, which obviously builds a lot of instruments for uh, space uh, observation. So we would carry their instruments in our payload box, send it to the stratosphere. So here is the fun part. Uh, when you just send up a balloon, Right? It is not tethered. It's 40 kilometers. You cannot have like a wire connecting it or like a like a like a thread or whatever. Uh, so it, it would just fly, and uh, there was and we had to recover the balloon once it comes down. It could fall wherever on Earth, right? So that's where a lot of math and that's where a lot of uh, route uh, analysis and things like that come in. So we we would we would study the wind patterns. We would study you know wind direction, wind velocity, so on and so forth, and actually do modeling saying, okay, if I launch it from this location, where is it likely to land and when is it likely to land? Because we could, all, we could actually have like a cutoff mechanism, the balloon is there, and we can say after one hour of flight, when it reaches this altitude, there is an automated cutoff, which kind of separates the, uh, the payload from the, from the balloon, and this you know, comes down in a parachute and falls wherever, right? So we'd obviously have G. How big is the balloon? The, the box size? was typically um, the size of this chair. It's, it's this big, right? And the balloon? The balloon was bigger than this room. We'd have like three or four of them. So it's a really big uh, helium balloon. So what we would do is, one, we would let it fly. Once we, and we track all along. You know, we have a tracker, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a GPS tracker, uh, which would keep transmitting every 10 seconds uh, where its location is uh, using VHF, UHF uh, frequencies. Uh, because obviously, after you go a certain height, you'll not have your cell phone coverage. So you cannot do, you cannot use your, your, your uh, typical cell phone based GSM uh, modules for communication. So it would keep communicating, and we would have a terminal. We'd have two things we'd have a ground terminal uh, at a fixed location. We also have a car fitted with a terminal, with a driver, just chasing the balloon. You know, if you see it flying over, <laughs> we, we just try and follow it. You know, obviously, you can't see it after it reaches a certain altitude, but you know it's there because you, know, you can see the, uh, see the blip on the screen. So we would do that. And uh, you know, we did a lot of those experiments. I think uh, we flew more than 10 times uh, 
the first year. Yes. Um, yeah, I was wondering how long did it take to to reach uh, for the balloon to reach the, the, the not long, not long, uh, 15, 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what kind of things were you testing on those platforms? Like all scientific instruments. Uh, so, like how they react in like uh, low pressures or temperatures or what? Yeah. So, for example, there was a comet uh, that was passing by uh, for the first time. Uh, it, it was coming. It was passing by the Earth for the first time, called as Ison. You remember Ison? Yeah. So we were one of the few groups in this part of the world. Uh, there was a group from China as well that was actually doing Ison uh, experiments. So we wanted to actually see what this ISON is all about. What does it look like? Uh, so we, you know, uh, Indian Institute of Astrophysics did build, uh, you know, instruments to, to study ISON. And we did all the testing on our platform. So we sent it up there to, to test. But that was not recovered. Well, so here is, so we were also unlucky a lot of times. Uh, you know, we would not recover the balloons. It would just get lost. Uh, but to our credit, uh, this one time when we when we uh, when we let it fly, uh, the cutoff mechanism didn't work. You know, it failed somewhere midway, and this went and got stuck in about 28 uh, kilometer altitude. And there are winds, you know, uh, and the winds are very stable winds. It's just going in one direction. So we could see the balloon just flying all the way. We could track it till almost it reached the coast of Africa. And uh, and then we lost contact, and we said, "Hey, it's lost. So you know, the the equipment is gone, uh, the balloon is gone. So that's it. So let's go back home." But good science you got, Atta. Yeah. So so things didn't end there. After a few days, we we got some blips, and then we realized that the you know the ocean currents had actually brought our payload box back closer to India. So after almost 20 days of losing it in sea, <laughs> so uh, we actually sent a, sent a rescue team uh, to actually go there and, and, uh, and bring that back. So we did some fun stuff. Honestly speaking, uh, not talking in terms of reliability and things like that, uh, in the 10 odd flights we had in the first year, uh, first two were a failure, complete failure. It, it didn't work at all. Uh, and only one of them after that was a failure. So seven uh, out of 10 times it works. It worked for us. So we didn't do any more to give you a statistically right answer. But uh, so that was, I mean, we did things like this, right? Uh, things that were, uh, you know, a little out of the box. Uh, there, were, there were no other vendors for this in the country. Uh, so we did things like this uh, to earn a little bit of money to kind of cross subsidize our, our efforts. In so, the so the revenue plan. is the customer gives you money for bringing some equipment. Yes, there. yes. So uh, that was not our primary business. Our primary business is not to send uh, platforms uh, to the stratosphere for testing. Our primary business is building satellites. But we did all this mm -hmm. in order to kind of just cross subsidize our efforts uh, uh, while building satellites. So. And then what we did was uh, we we formed this uh, partnership with uh, you know uh, Berlin Space Technologies. It's a great company out of uh, out of Berlin. Uh, it's uh, it, it started in as a as a program in uh, TU Berlin and then uh, spun off into a company. So they've been around for more than ten years now. So these guys were one of our biggest supporters. They believed in what we did and they were also friends. You know <laughs> they they liked us. Uh, so they, they, we would hang out whenever they came to Bangalore and whenever we went to Europe, we would hang out. So they had a spare satellite. So they had like they had built satellites uh, for for their clients and they had a you know everything that was required to build a spare satellite. And uh, so here is the thing: building a satellite is not a big deal, right? You can build a satellite. You put in the money. You can get all the components. You can put that together. But getting launch is really, really difficult, right? Uh, first of all, uh, launch slots, the demand far exceeds the supply. So you always have a launch shortage. So I think in, what is the waiting period for SpaceX? SpaceX right now because of the two accidents, it's around two and a half years. Yeah, so if you build something today, okay. if you want a slot on SpaceX, uh, Falcon, you have to wait two and a half years. Okay. Just to get a slot, just to go. It may go or may not go. I mean, uh, anything can happen. So if you, by the way, uh, have you heard of PSLV? None of you have heard of PSLV? You will come to know about it in detail tomorrow. But, but yeah, so let me just tell you. PSLV is the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle of India. It, uh, is, uh, it is built by ISRO. 
and it is known to be the world's most reliable rocket. It, it was commissioned in 1993. Till date, we've had 40 flights. And uh, only the first flight was a failure. After that, everything was a success. So no, no country in the world has this kind of a record for uh, rocket launches. We have the most uh, reliable rocket in the world. It also happens to be, by pure coincidence, one of the most economical rockets. I'll not call it cheap. Uh, it's really economical, right? Cost per kilogram, if you compare it, uh, you know, by the way, uh, when, you, when, you, when you book a rocket to send something to space, they charge you by, by the kilogram, right? So if you have like a one kilogram satellite, they will charge you $100,000 for it. And uh, if you have, so it, it, it multiples. So typically, a traditional satellite would be the size, would be maybe twice or thrice the size of this room. It would typically be about uh, over a ton, right? Uh, <coughs> that's the size we're talking about. So launch is super expensive. It's sometimes as expensive as the satellite itself, right? So just as a quick footnote, by the way, it turns out Switzerland's first ever satellite was built by EPFL, from what I heard, uh, called the Swiss Cube. Oh, which is a little thing, and was sent up by PSLV. Yes, it was launched by India. So, by the way, uh, did you know the Indian space program? Okay, how old do you think is the Indian space program? Uh, let me ask you the question in a different way. Shoot out some random answer. 70s, <coughs> since the 70s. You're close. <laughs> Sixties. <laughs> yes, you're right. So, uh, ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization, was started in 1969, right? As After the moon fashion. successful moon landing. Yes. No, and but initial footstep was laid before, well, in, since 1965. Okay. 69, it was officially August 15, 69 is when it officially started. As so, ISRO, before that, it was in COSPAR, Indian National Committee on Space. So. The point I'm trying to make here is, Satya, the Indian space program is older than the IT industry. Right, absolutely, yes. absolutely. It's, it's way older than the IT industry, right? And uh, so IT is just now, right? The space program has been around forever. I mean, from my perspective, I mean, I was not even <laughs> born then. <laughs> so uh, most of the action in space happens in Bangalore, right? Uh, ISRO is headquartered in Bangalore. Uh, ISRO has many divisions, uh, uh, R&D divisions out of Bangalore. Uh, and most of the new space companies now, for the last five years, are in Bangalore. So Bangalore is where all the action is when it comes to space technology. Uh, so if you look at it, again, space, you, you have everything from satellites and launch vehicles on this side to services on the other side. Just to give you an example, I mean, all of us, are, I mean, all of us use space technology directly or indirectly every day, right? Can you, can you just take a few examples? Yeah. Yes. GPS, of course. We all use GPS on our phones. Or most of us do. <laughs> okay, Rohan, why don't you give some examples of how we use space? This example is direct to home uh, television, DTH, and uh, internet. Basically, uh, internet is being through satellites. So mm -hmm. two most common things which we use on a daily basis. So usually how it works, the backhaul is all satellites. I mean, if not, you know, under undersea cables, it's it's usually satellites. You, we will never see it. I mean, when, when the internet comes into our homes, it is usually wireless or it could be like a fiber or uh, DSL or whatever, you know, technology. But, you know, from, you know, the backhaul, how does, you know, Asia get connected to Europe, you know, uh, when it comes to internet? It is through satellites. So. Yeah, space is an interesting industry to be in. And it makes money. <laughs> and it makes a lot of money. So this is new space, right? No, that's traditional. It's traditional space. New space, that's another story. I will get to that. So before that, let's... You said before that the space industry was... The space was to everyone. And there was no uh, possibility to arm the space. Correct. To weaponize it. To weaponize it. But is it not what is doing uh, the US? Well, see... Uh, these are all gray areas, right? And that's why we have these uh, treaties, international treaties uh, and international agencies uh, to kind of keep a watch. Just like how you have uh, an agency that you know keeps track of all nuclear installations just to see that somebody is not enriching uranium. You, know, you also have agencies, uh, UN bodies, uh, 
UNOSA is one of them. Uh, there are a couple of UN bodies that you know uh, regulate this and that also act as a watchdog. So uh, it's not easy to put weapons in space, but people have. You know, Russia has done it, China has done it, US has done it. Uh, Apparently, it was uh, Ronald Reagan's plan to put nukes in space. <laughs> so yes, so that's that's all you know a, a brief background about uh, the space industry, right? Uh, new space is interesting. So there is the old space and the new space. What is old space? Uh, NASA, ESA, DLR, ISRO, JAXA, so on and so forth. You know all these space agencies. Why were they all state funded? It's expensive to. <laughs> It's very, very expensive. All of them had over a billion dollars in budget every year. Uh, so that's what you needed to run a space agency. So companies could not afford it, not, uh, at least not until recently, right? So traditionally, com countries or governments have been funding space agencies. And uh, back in the day, uh, okay, even, even today to some extent, uh, some of these components, right? First of all, in space, the conditions are very, very harsh. Yeah, well, you're, yeah, if you're facing the sun, it's around plus 120 degrees Celsius. If you're facing the sun, if you're in the Earth's shadow, that's around minus 150 degrees Celsius. So, when you build something to work in space, it has to work in that uh, tolerance uh, region, right? Minus 150 to plus 120. Also, uh, the sun is spoo uh, spewing out venom every now and then in terms of radiation. So, uh, all your electronics... UV? No, UV is the Which least one? bothered least. thing. It's gamma rays. Alpha. So, X-rays, so this will all burn out the electronics inside the satellite. So, it had to be rad hardened. So, so that is radiation hardened. hardened. So, yeah. they do what is called as radiation hardening of components to kind of prevent it from getting burnt out by these radiations. And so, I imagine all of this is happening here now. Nothing, yeah, yeah. Nothing's coming from outside sort of. See, the Indian space program, uh, we are very proud to say that it is completely indigenous. We built everything on our own. Uh, of course, we've taken help from other countries. Uh, we have also helped other countries while we're doing that. Right. But it is completely our own technology, right? Uh, in fact, we uh, apparently have the highest number of communication satellites in the world. Uh, How many do we I have? I don't, I don't even know the number. <laughs> but one thing you can add, we need 70 more. We need 70 more. In so the next three more. years. In the next three years, yes. Okay, uh, sorry, question. When you say we need 70 the more, country the needs. India needs 70 India. more Indian. communication satellite to cope with the demand of yes. the population. How many, how many people have smartphones? They want 4G. They, they want, want to 5G. watch TV. They want to watch TV yeah. uh, on the phone. So India has also got its own uh, watch GPS. education videos. And, uh, <laughs> nobody does that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were talking about radiation hardened uh, components, right? So all this is expensive. When you take a normal component and you want to radiation harden it and want, if you want to make it work in space, your cost goes up a hundred times at the least. So if your component is costing a dollar on, on ground from Radio Shack or from you know whatever supermarket, you want to radiation harden it and make it space grade, it'll be a hundred bucks, right? So that's the cost differential. So one that, that was one of the things that used to drive the cost up. And building rockets is really expensive. We, we'll let him talk about it later. Uh, Just because you're talking about rockets, I want to say the word countdown. <laughs> so traditionally, the space industry was funded by governments because everything was expensive uh, in the 70s and the 60s. Uh, as we came closer to the 80s, right? So of course, you need to you need to you need to understand that any component can have different grading, right? Mm -hmm. You can have the space grade, which is radiation hardened, made, you know, proven to work under those you know extreme conditions. Then you have the military grade, which is you know which is supposed to work in really bad conditions as well, right? Uh, you know, when you are on the mountain or when you are in sea, it should still work. You know, your it should not crash just because it's in a uh, it's in a you know difficult terrain. So you have the military grade components, which are also, you know, uh, when you when you look at the reliability of those components, are a lot higher. And then you have the commercial grade components, the stuff in your cell phones, then your in your television, in your microwaves, in your refrigerators. The stuff there is not radiation hardened. It need not be. You now we have the Earth's atmosphere to prevent it from all the radiation, harmful radiations, <laughs> and things like that. So it need, you don't need to radiation harden those. And uh, you don't want something that will last a lifetime. You want to change your fridge. 
you don't want to see the same refrigerator or you want to get a new television uh, you don't want it to work forever so you don't really have a <laughs> you need a reason to throw it out so uh, and of, of course also from a business model perspective companies need to make it last only for a certain time so they can upgrade you to new televisions and make more revenues yeah. out of you so what is the typical shelf life of a satellite the typical shelf life of a satellite is 15 years 15 okay uh 15 years that's for a comsat Yes. for a comsat okay yeah, for mm. the low earth orbit satellites which are used for even i will get to that <laughs> so i would like you to hold on to that <laughs> so typically it's 15 years okay. so uh, essentially so that that is one thing one everything was expensive and you had to build stuff that was really massive you needed rockets that 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 had the capacity to take all these you know over a ton worth of uh, you know satellites up to orbit and when you look at orbits right uh you have low earth orbits and you have the geostationary orbit have you heard of geostationary orbits yeah. what is a geostationary orbit uh, geostationary is that it's rotating at the same way <coughs> as the earth so you always have the same spot yes yeah. you know it's sad that you cannot be in the video while you're answering these <laughs> <laughs> geostationary is somewhere here that's the earth this is the earth 36000 kilometers from here this is 36000 kilometers right and low earth orbits start at around 300 kilometers which is right here may go up to, up to 800 kilometers sometimes 1200 but you know still not okay so what happens when you launch a satellite a communication satellite to go so the reason why it's here is you just need one satellite and it is always so let's say this is uh, this is switzerland and there's a satellite here the satellite the line of sight will never change it will always be the same while it's you know moving and rotating and things like that so it's always there whereas if you if you put a satellite here it has its own orbits right or it could be like this or whatever hmm so essentially what you need to do so let's say this costs uh, about 600 million dollars to build right if you need to build something for a low earth orbit it's a few million uh it's not 600 it's just a few but you, the line of sight is not always there you know it's always moving so it's here now in 5 minutes it moves away to the next location and and so on and so forth it comes back to the location but after a while so essentially what what has happened in the recent past is because it's expensive to go to geostationary orbits and geostationary orbits are a limited resource it's a natural resource of course space is a natural resource and uh, you know we it's not unlimited you know it's we just only have a certain number of slots you cannot have 100 satellites here watching uh, switzerland all the time there's just no space right right so because of that one it's expensive to just get the you know get those uh, orbit slots uh, and it's also you know there are various regulations uh, uh, by the way all these orbit slots get uh, allocated uh, out of uh, geneva ITU. at the itu itu yeah itu is the regulator for orbit slots and uh, and spectrum and things like that so and it's super crowded is what i was told so this today. place is super crowded yeah <laughs> itu also is super crowded so es- essentially what what people started doing when things so first we spoke about a couple of things we spoke about radiation hardened space grade you know uh, components then we spoke about military grade components and then we spoke about commercial grade components right uh this is the most expensive let's say this is 100 bucks right military grade was like between 50 and 60 bucks this was 1 dollar right wow. over time right from the 60s till now uh, obviously reliability of components have increased what was you know sp- uh, space grade in the 60s was available in military grade components uh, in the 80s and it's today available in commercial grade components today i can just go buy something from ebay put it together send it to space and it works and how big would it small yeah and uh, have you heard of moore's law the then <laughs> that you've heard yeah. uh, it's the exponential uh, growth i mean it's about information technology really right yes so it's like uh, with every 2 years it's like about 18 months 18 months every 18 months uh, your uh, you know compute capabilities double but your cost halves right so it's like this right every 18 months 
it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. This is the cost. And uh, your compute is increasing. So essentially what this does is because of uh, electronics also follow Moore's law, right? I mean, it's basically electronics, not, pre, not so much IT uh, yeah. generally, right? And what we're talking about electronic components here. So because of that, over the years, right, the components have become cheaper and smaller. So when you could have like a, I mean, today you can have like billions of resistors in a small, you know, you know, area. It used to be billions of resistors when it, when resistors were invented would probably be the size of this building, right? So what, what has happened is one, it's become cheaper and two, it has become uh, smaller and three, it is all available in commercial grade at, at the commercial grade price point. So today, companies like mine can actually build a satellite which would essentially do what a, a, a big satellite would do at, you know, instead of 600 million at maybe 3 million or 5 million. So that is the opening up of the new space industry. And the size also, and the size has also come down. So before, like I said, you know, each satellite would be three, three, three times the size of this room. Now it is the size of this chair or maybe, you know, half the size of this table. In fact, some of the satellites are even smaller. You know, there's something called as CubeSats, which is like a 10 inch by 10 inch by 10 inch. It's just like a 10 inch cube. You can just hold it in your hand. So that was the Swiss Cube. That was the Swiss Cube. <laughs> ah, so Switzerland uh, launched a Swiss Cube. On PSLV. <laughs> at the ISRO PSLV. Yes. And it was the size of a shoebox? Like? It was smaller, it was half the size of a shoebox. Half the size of a shoebox. It's basically 10 centimeters. It's 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters. <laughs> So, yeah, so this is the fascinating uh, new space industry and new space industry globally is only about 10 years old, right? Uh, it's only about 10 years back that right. it became economically viable for people, you know, companies to build satellites, small satellites yeah. and go to low Earth orbits. And so today there are companies, you know, including Facebook and Google, they have plans to launch, you know, thousands of satellites, uh, you know, for various purposes. They'll all fly in constellation because you know, they, they cannot, they don't have the luxury of being geostationary. Uh, so they will keep, you know, you'll have like a big constellation of uh, satellites, you know, flying around. How is the space going around with all the satellites rolling up? How, how do you know where you can launch it exactly? Because I, I guess you have a lot of dead satellites and so on. And there's also a lot of debris. So once, once satellites die, which they do, uh, especially Not here, much. It's all garbage. So actually, we do have uh, various treaties again, where we have to do compulsory deorbiting in the in the near future. It was never there before. What happens to a communication satellite is they send it off to what is called as a graveyard orbit. There is something called as a graveyard orbit, and uh, you know once the satellite dies, it just gets pushed to graveyard. Orbit. Okay, how do they do that? How do they push a satellite? There's no gravity, or there is no. Uh, I mean, it's it's in vacuum. It's in how do they? If you increase velocity, I think. You would How do you increase like, velocity? I guess you'd have to have some sort of thrusters. Yes. So I will let uh, uh, Rohan take uh, you know this from now. Uh, he can talk about thrusters. He can talk about. I just have a question because we, t we are talking about uh, trashes, garbage, and so on. Is there an uh, Indian company that is going to create like uh, what do you say, a garbage uh, truck to clean everything? <laughs> well, you know, garbage collection. <laughs> Satellite garbage collection. Yeah, that's another startup based out of Japan. They, I mean, recently got around 20 million dollars. No, oh, that was a government thing, which JAXA launched, but they do have a private startup. Uh, recently, they raised around 5 million dollars of VC fund. So its sole purpose is to build uh, trucks which go to space and collect this debris and come down. See, but if you look at it, small satellites, the moment it enters the Earth's atmosphere, it burns up. So essentially what we are re required to do now, given that we are adding so many satellites up there, once it is end of life, we need to deorbit it. We need to you know, bring it closer and closer, let it fall into the Earth's atmosphere so it, 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 it burns and you know, you don't see it. And, uh, as Abhishek was discussing, I think he has given you a complete overview of what uh, the space ecosystem is like. Well, to start with, uh, many people questioned in the early 60s why India required a space program. Yes. So, because India was a developing nation, so we got independence from the British in 1947. It was fairly a young uh, country, even though we are a very old civilization, but in terms of uh, independence, we were still a very young country. So, when there are, we have people to feed, there are many people questioned why should we invest in space. Uh, 
So, well, uh, Vikram Sarabhai gave away, I mean, he is the founding father of Indian space program, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. So, his answer was uh, like this. Uh, we do not have fancies to compete with uh, economically developed uh, countries like US or Europe or Russia uh, just to have space exploration, manned, uh, manned landing on the moon or something else. We want to utilize space technologies for the benefit of uh, Indian people. That is why when China is so aggressively pursuing space, ISRO is not in a mood to compete with them. So, the main goal of ISRO was to contribute to its nations that is satellites in terms of communication and other satellites in terms of remote sensing, meteorological data, defense satellites uh, all for national building. And navigation? Yeah, that was recently which uh, because uh, since what happens is since you rely on U, uh, GPS is US satellites. So, GLONASS is Russia satellite. So, in terms of in ter when you have a war, so you need GPS signals for the missile to guide itself, so they might cut down the signals for the missiles. So, on a strategic perspective, so it is better for a country to have its own navigation system. So, we do? Uh, we do now. Uh, so, it has been just 3 years since it is all operational when it started. It is IRNSS series. So, this was the main perspective behind Indian space program. So, I, I would like to talk to you about why I got into space, what interested me to get into space. How did you get into space? How did I get into and space? And when you got into space? And when did I, get, when I got into <laughs> space? So, for example, the fascination with space was there from childhood. My dad was a physicist. So, I am from a very small hill station. Basically, I think how I can relate myself to you all. You are from Switzerland. It is a hill station basically. It is a beautiful a beautiful country. So, I think uh, Divya's father is from uh, same place I am. It is Uti, it is called, it is a southern hill station in the western Ghats. So, it is not that cold as you would experience for us. It is it's, it is cold, you do not get snow because we are near the equator. So, around December, I think the maximum temperature below it will go to minus 2 degrees. Being born in a hill station, you are basically in a region where you are locked from the outside world, not having much exposure to what you have. But uh, my dad, uh, no, night, my bedtime stories was Stephen Hawking's uh, books. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, fascination grew right from there. But uh, the reality of getting into space, I was not aware of. Uh, what difficulties you should face, all these things. So apparently, after my twelfth grade, I got into a physics course in Kerala. So up and then I found, I think I'm not a physics guy. I'm an engineering guy. So I did one year there. I quit uh, physics. I got back to engineering. Uh, in Coimbatore, it is a city, big city, it is a metropolitan city in uh, just around three, year, uh, 3 hours drive from Uti. So, uh, we wanted to do something in space. So, I got into this business not to earn money basically. I want to do what I want to do. So, uh, and for that you need money. That money, how does it come? It comes from business. And that is Abhishek's problem. <laughs> that is Abhishek's problem. <laughs> so, this was the main agenda be behind doing something. But India is a country where people only believe in you once you demonstrate something. So, they do not actually respect you on what you say. Say in the western countries, uh, they judge based on your capabilities. They would know you can do it just by talking. Be whereas, here th there is competition. They would only believe once you demonstrate something. So, we had the that is something that we have to demonstrate. So, I was in college. So, I graduated in 2014 uh, in aeronautical engineering. Well, I joined college in 2010. So, well, we had an aim of uh, that we have to do something in this field. So, well, this company was started when I was 18 years of age. Uh, well, as I said, we wanted to do something. So, the question which was put in front of us was either join ISRO well, okay, that was an option worth to be exploring because you get to do what you want to do. But the question, uh, but the question was like this: you get to do what you want to do only when you are 50 years of age. That is when you grow up the hierarchy chart. So when you're in that director position, th then only you get to do things. So then, until then, you get to listen to what your superiors say and do it slowly. So and the academic environment in India is more theory focused. It's not practically uh, this thing. So, these were the downsides. So, then we thought, okay, let, let me pursue my higher education somewhere abroad and uh, say for example, join NASA or something like that. But for that, you have to be a US citizen, which I am not and it would take more time. So, but uh, being nationalist, uh, I, I wanted to do something back here. So, the only option we got is to why not start a company of your own. For that, uh, these guys were inspiration because uh, we never knew something like private space company could in fact exist. <laughs> so, then uh, so there was Dhruva space which was already there. 
So that gave a confidence that okay, something like this can happen. So how I got in touch with them was I needed one of their balloon platforms to test one of my payloads. <laughs> <laughs> So that's how we got in touch. Yeah. I mean, when you need the platform, that means you, you already had the money or some stuff in place to, to yeah, yeah, build yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. So I'll come to how we got the money. <laughs> okay. so it's, a, it's just a story. So how this Bellatrix Aerospace was itself founded is a four-year story. It started in 2010, it ended in 2014, okay. because we officially incorporated the company in 2014. So see, money is everything. And being an undergrad, uh, you're uh, not entitled to huge funds from the government of India. Huge funds are only given to PhD scholars or uh, postgraduate students in an elite university. So everyone doesn't have access to grants. And even though you get a grant, the time for the grant to get released and come to your account will take somewhere between one and a half to two years. So I would be out of college by then. So my only option was where do I get the money? So apparently, so I was uh, fortunate enough to travel abroad, say three or four countries for conferences where I met Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong. So 2012, so they all inspired to do something in this field. So that cemented my uh, thought process basically. So came back to India. So to start with 2010, uh, we didn't know what to do. Let us, we thought let us experiment with rocketry. So we didn't even know we sh you should take a permission. Because if you launch a rocket, if it crosses two kilometers, <laughs> it, there's an air force base nearby. It is falsely understood as a missile launch. <laughs> Okay, so what we did was we built our own, uh, before uh, for building a rocket you need the propellant in place. So we started s illegally sourcing, uh, forging <laughs> principal signature and uh, college principal signature in illegally sourcing the propellant. Uh, first what Is happened it was, or it's <laughs> <laughs> now it's on the record, now everybody knows. <laughs> yes, everybody knows. So 2010, so first we'll, I'll say brewing the propellant, okay, brewing the rocket fuel. So uh, the lab didn't give us permission to utilize the oven where you need to heat it to around 120 degrees so that the powder becomes a batter. You can pour it into the mold. So we went to, I was a hostel student, so I went to my day scholar friend's house who was staying with his grandmother. So we used this induction stove. <laughs> <laughs> and started cooking uh, And started to cooking the propellant and up, we had a Rocky huge explosion. House. Yeah, okay. we had a huge explosion. The whole house was on fire. So my whole, this hand was, uh, I mean, I had to undergo plastic surgery here and here. So whole tummy, so it was a very bad accident. Oh my God. And uh, the house was on fire, whereas the owner, the house owner uh, was shouting, my house is on fire and uh, I don't uh, care whether these boys die or not, I want my house intact. <laughs> but uh, it was a village. Uh, uh, the people around were so friendly, they came, they poured water, they took us out. So. <laughs> Can I ask what kind of rocket fuel you're making? I mean, I'm like, I the, this is ammonium perchlorate uh, with aluminium. Okay. okay, this is what ISRO uses. So yeah, many uh, tried to play with sugar pro propellants to start with, whereas we said, let us play with the professional, uh, professional propellants. So this was the initial experience, but what happened that pain which you undergo, so cemented your uh, thought process that you should do something in this. So because then only you get to know that you have that, now you have that emotional attachment to this field. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's how it started, but then we came to know, let, let us not do rockets for a while. So we started concentrating on some writing papers, reading something, because some, you're not uh, thought uh, all these things in your engineering course. So it's, as I said, it's just theory oriented. So I was known to bunk college, go out, but not to go have, uh, watch movies, but to read other things. So we had a question, if you want to start a company, what is the economic model in which the company would survive? So we started looking at uh, various problems what so we wanted to do something which others had not attempted before see you're competing with some big giants in the space industry and you being just to start from scratch from india you can only survive or get noticed when you do something when things which are not attempted at so you cannot do a rocket of course there is no money but our initial goal was to develop a nano satellite launch vehicle so now as i said two and a half years is your wait time what if we have a rocket <coughs> that I can launch it every day. It, it becomes cheap. Another example uh, in front of my eyes was, so for example, sir, you travel from New Delhi to New York and every trip you throw away the airplane. Will you be able to afford air travel? No. So why space is unaffordable? Because the rockets which you build are expended in, uh, to the seas. It is not recovered. Only SpaceX, Elon Musk, the Tesla's uh, owner, he only demonstrated that uh, rockets can be reused. So this is a new technology, but in order to do something like that, to do the engine, the money requirement is huge. 
So we thought we are not uh, electronics people, we are core mechanical guys. So what we can do is something related to engines. So what we thought was either way as Abhishek was telling, the purpose of a rocket is not to launch a satellite. So let me make this point very clear. <laughs> okay? The purpose of a rocket is to impart sufficient velocity to the satellite so that it does not come down. So there is an orbit known as a parking orbit, so around 400 kilometers from Earth's surface, where a rocket injects a satellite at roughly around 7 kilometers per second speed. So this is the speed required for the satellite to stay afloat. If not, the Earth's gravity would pull it down. Our job, what we do thrusters, which are engines inbuilt into the satellite, from that parking orbit, it raises, boosts orbit and reaches 36,000 kilometers. So, uh, now what happens in a communication satellite, which is here, is it weighs around 3.5 tons, 3,500 kilograms. Out of these 3,500 kilograms, 2,000 kilograms is just fuel, fuel required to do that orbit raising. So, you have only useful mass of around 1.5 tons, out of which 1 ton is just the structure. You only have uh, 500 kilograms for some useful <coughs> payload. So since see, leasing out transponders from a satellite is very uh, expensive, say for example per week you pay 1 million dollar per week. So this is the cost to lease a transponder in a satellite. Okay. Each big satellite carry around 20 transponders. What is a transponder? It is a payload which is used to communicate, send microwaves, all your internet, all this stuff. So instead of having 20 transponders, what question we had was can not we increase it to 60 transponders? so that the return on investment of a satellite increases. Mm -hmm. How do I do it? The answer was right in front of us, reduce the fuel. But normal chemical uh, systems uh, will consume lot of fuel. So we thought where uh, there is a propulsion system known as electric propulsion, it does not use much fuel, say it gives more mileage to per uh, liter of fuel consumed. So the technical term is specific impulse, but on road is a per uh, mileage per gallon in, as a car would give. So, we were able to develop a thruster which would use only 200 kilograms of fuel, not 2000 and fit it in the same platform and we demonstrated a thruster which works on just drinking water as a fuel. We ionize it, we make, turn the water into a plasma, that plasma is expelled out at higher velocities thus giving you thrust. So this technology was developed and how did I get funding, so I had to spend one year searching for funds. Fortunately, I met an uh, Indian billionaire, uh, Sajjan Jindal of JSW Steels Limited. So he is a uh, steel guy in India, who, I mean he is a big uh, industrialist. So he ha gave a grant of around 20 lakh Indian rupees, so around 40,000 US dollars. So with that money, we were able to develop a prototype and then we approached ISRO and uh, well, the initial, we initially saw the lower and the middle level people, where they were not that encouraging. So, and then we met the chairman apparently, the chairman was a chief guest in one of my friends, my co-founder's college. So he went to the stage and caught, of, caught hold of him and gave him, mm -hmm. see this is what we are doing. And he was like, this is what we were looking for. And uh, then uh, it all happened like uh, we are here now, they gave a contract, developmental contract with uh, 2 crore rupees, so around half a million dollar to develop these technologies for ISRO. So this is the first time. ISRO is partnering with a third party for a technology intake. So it has never happened in India. So it is like they develop the technology, they only outsource it for others and they buy back. But this is for this, this was the first time where they are taking in a technology developed by a third party. That was startup. So Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so that was a starting point. So we are uh, into in space propulsion. So as I said, now Abhishek is talking about low earth orbit satellites. When you talk about low earth orbit, a satellite is not stationary. So you need multiple satellites at, uh, so that at one given point of time, it covers that part. So when you see a bird, the birds, they do formation flying, they fly together. So in space, if all these satellites need to do formation flying, the two low, uh, small satellites, you need propulsion systems. And these thrusters, you cannot uh, you put big, big thrusters. You need technology which are so small. So we developed a thruster which is just one inch in length. So this is called a nano thruster. So for uh, for example, so such thrusters can be used to for these cube satellites, uh, so that uh, nano satellites, for example, and formation flying is possible. And once the life goes, and since this is fuel efficient, you have still uh, uh, enough amount of fuel left for it to deorbit. Wow. You can so that you are not creating junk 
as well as more satellites can be launched. So, uh, this is what with this we want to go global and with what income you get out of this we actually plan to build a nano, uh, I mean a nano satellite launch vehicle which is recoverable and we are in the process of raising uh, venture capital investment. So, we are in talks uh, apparently two, three concerns have agreed to put. So, this is our current so stage. Uh, no, we have products ranging for bigger satellites up to nano satellites. So, we are in the in space propulsion category. So, you need an engine for a satellite to keep it alive basically. So, we are in that segment, it is a sub, it's a major subsystem of a satellite. So, this, uh, there are not many players who are in this domain, they are only big, big agencies. So, are, are these other competitors also, uh, do they also have these plasma thrusters? Yeah, they have plasma thrusters. See, electric propulsion is a big domain. So, they have different type of plasma thrusters. What we have, I call it is a water thruster. So, you just pour water and it flies. So, water is abundantly available on the moon. See, few people, see when you talk so about you business terms. You are using water as a fuel? Yeah, yeah. So, we are the first ones to demonstrate. Fuel. But as a thruster, right? Yeah, it's a fuel basically. Oh, so basically yeah. becomes a fuel. Yeah. Me, yeah, I am not done engineering. Neither am <laughs> <laughs> It's not space anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, why we chose water? So, this was another problem statement. Uh, see, water is available on the moon, on the Mars. So, if you want to have interplanetary travel, you have to carry more payloads, not more fuel. So, it is just like uh, fuel depots or cafe coffee, I mean cafeterias on your uh, space voyage. So, moon has water, Mars has water. So, it will enable you for interplanetary transit. And see, a uh, lot of resources are available on the moon to mine. It, uh, that is the future, for example, Luxembourg uh, near Germany. So, they only have the recently released the space law for uh, outer space mining. As of last week. Yeah. So, see, uh, you know gold is available in the ocean lot of gold is available, but why do not you mine it? Because the value of gold is less than the value of mining. So, your mining cost becomes expensive, that is why you do not go for it. So, why do not you mine from the moon? It is really expensive to go to the moon, but if you have such technology, say my thruster is like a tug, it is an earth's orbit, you launch a rocket with water, feed it with water, it takes the payload, the mining equipment to the moon. So, from moon you have a soil which is up to the orbit, it attaches to the thruster, just give it water, it brings to earth. So, transport is cheap and from earth to space, if you have reusable rockets, so all this makes sense mm -hmm. and how long will you depend on earth's natural resources for our survival. So, this is the big thing. See, a lot of precious elements are available on the moon. So, it makes sense for us to invest in technology today. So, it was a big picture which we thought mm -hmm. and um, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, would it be even better to mine uh, a comet because there is basically giant blocks of ice? Yeah. Oh, catch it. No, but uh, no, the, uh, I mean he put a uh, very uh, valued question, but moon is nearer than a comet. A comet is but not… Eventually, maybe? Yeah, you can go to the comet <laughs> as long as water is available. See, water is available on the moon, on Mars and Jupiter's moon called uh, Europa. Europa and then Saturn's moon. Uh, Enceladus. So, water is there uh, throughout the solar system. You just So, those are all your cafeterias for example, which gives water to the thruster. So, all this is uh, makes sense, but what makes real sense now is moon is near and it is full of resources. So, why, why do not we exploit moon first? Moon is like a geostationary. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it is always there. You can always yeah. see it once you go. So, it is like the cheesecake. So, uh, I mean uh, in your childhood you have your parents say that moon is made of cheese. So, apparently it makes sense in, uh, in terms of techno economics. So, well, uh, that is what that is how we started. Now, we are a team of 8 people working on different type of thrusters. So, once the investment comes in we plan to also develop some engines for this, but we want to do it with in collaboration with ISRO and DRDO. We have some other projects with the defense establishment Just which speak, is… Sorry. DRDO is Defense Research Development Organization. Yeah. What does it do? Uh, so, they, are, they do missiles. Not just missiles. missiles. They do Anything everything. related to defense technology yeah. in India yeah. is, uh, yeah. is built by DRDO. Yeah. Yeah. So, we have, Thomas, we have somebody, some. Sorry, somebody had a question whether India has an army. So, it has a very, very big army. So, so India has, has the army. third largest army in the world. Air Force. Fourth largest Air Force. Fourth largest Air Force. Second largest Navy. Second largest Navy in the whole world. And a couple of years ago, we were the biggest importers of uh, defense, defense equipment. equipment. Because our indigenous production capabilities was far less when compared to our uh, demand. So, I think we are still one of the okay. biggest importers of defense equipment. So, every year, every uh, two years, we have uh, the Defense Expo, where you have pretty much 
Yeah. You know, the who's who. All the com uh, companies uh, that, that want to sell to India are there. So the who's who of the defense world is there. So I think the largest uh, fighter planes, Rafale, was bought by India, right? No, well, that was the biggest touted deal back then, but it, yeah, it is not now. The but the yeah. Because, see, once you wait, the cost of these things go high. Mm -hmm. So the requirement was around 130 such fighters, whereas now, for the same money, $10 billion, for $10 billion, now we are only getting 36. So that, that is because of some political delays. So yeah, but this is the space industry we are into, so we wanted to do something and… Uh, Sorry, you were saying you are working with ISRO and DRDO? Yeah, DRDO projects are little confidential in which we work. So yeah, these are the two agencies which are actually nurturing and helping us. So ISRO is now open, before it was very closed, now they are opening up and they are experimenting on how to work with a startup, starting mm -hmm. with us. So, how has the experience been? Well, it's rather, uh, it is good as well as it's hectic because uh, those scientists are really capable guys and they expect you to be at their level. <laughs> so, they always grind a lot. Well, so they forget that these are just <laughs> kids straight out of college. Tell us your experience <laughs> in meeting the kids, president yes. of India and getting Yeah, so what happened was, uh, uh, the every year a national award is will, will be given by the president of India to a company which indigenizes a technology which has greater potential for tomorrow. So this one using water where the satellite cost, say for example, see everything when you take to space is money. Each kg is around, uh, each kilogram is around, uh, say for example, 40,000 US dollars. If you can bring it to 10,000 US dollars per kg, so imagine how much money uh, government can save. So this is one such promising technology. So we got a uh, national award from the president of India. For yeah. uh, the question, sorry, uh, well, which, which now means, as you said, you have to prove yourself to be recognized over here once you have this award, once you have really. Yeah, what happened what once we have the award? Ag agreed. Yeah. See, be before we got the award, none of the VCs were willing to even talk to us. <laughs> so, like, after the award, we will find you, we will find you. So, that's the change in the thing. So, we don't have too much time. If anybody has any questions, now's the time to ask. My question was how do you think um, government? space agencies evolve as the private sector comes in because as you were saying they're more like right now your partners but as do you think they will focus on some things because they used to do everything and now maybe they they become more focused as there's more not competition as you just said but other people see basically what happens is ISRO for example the government agency needs to transition itself from being a pro in a production mode to an R&D mode so we need more interplanetary or scientific missions which is required rather than building commsats or rockets which now industry is capable of doing. So the mode of transition would be they would get into the science and R&D mode whereas all the production the industry would take care. Uh, so uh, Elon Musk said that his goal for SpaceX is the colony on Mars. So uh -huh. what's your ultimate pie in the sky goal? Well I'm not as optimistic as Mr. Musk is. Because there are many technical, uh, I mean, hurdles which r still remains unanswered. Mm -hmm. Because see, either ways, Mars doesn't have a magnetosphere, mm -hmm. so all the UV rays comes, it, whatever colony you have, so it's it's going to degrade your cells. So a long-term inhabitation on Mars is something uh, uh, I don't think so makes much sense now. Mm -hmm. But a short trip is a viable option. But yeah, uh, space is the next business, is what I would say. Because of all the resources that yeah. it has, right? I mean, asteroids have a lot of uh, metals. So help us quantify this because we're business guys, right? So the point is, how big is it? Is it a today, hundred billion dollar business? Today, is space is business today space is? alone is three sixty billion dollar okay. business. In this, this does not take into account all the mining opportunities and things like that. Yes. That could exceed very well a trillion dollars. Okay, three sixty billion. And out of which the the launch part of it is one forty billion is one hundred and forty billion. billion yeah. And there, India is a strong player. Uh, well, for the satellites which weigh below uh, the one point five tons, That's for the satellite which weighs above one point five tons, SpaceX is stealing its business. Okay. That, that will yeah, the SpaceX, SpaceX is the leader. Yeah, yeah. The trade is going to go via Glencoe in Geneva, so everybody's <laughs> Until the advent of SpaceX, Ariane Space of France. Uh, e I mean, ES is a contractor. Right. They were the leaders in uh, launching heavy satellites. Mm -hmm. Okay, heavy is above what? One point five tons. Anything above two tons is considered Anything heavy. Above two tons. Yeah. Okay. So India is a leader for low cost launching, which in which satellites weigh below one point five tons. And how much of the one forty billion is that? 
as I say, we have not done the maths, uh, just around 15 percent as of now. India so, because majority is geo. Okay. India's, okay, just to give you perspective, uh, the budget of ISRO every yeah. year is about a billion dollars. Okay. That's it. Right. And where so India is, India sort of is a really small contributor in the space industry, right. uh, although we have a really uh, good launch vehicle, right. uh, we are yet to commercialize it. We have very few launches at the moment. We have what, six launches a year? Six launches, six launches a year. Until as compared to? As compared to one every week in the US. Okay. Or sometimes mm -hmm. more. And you have okay. private guys, you have the government, you have NASA, right. you have the Air Force, they have their own launch vehicles. Well, let okay. us make it uh, one. Okay, uh, uh, two per month. We should get to at least two per month to okay. to kind of uh, make a significant <coughs> contribution in this, or at least to capture the uh, you know market opportunity. Just to give you uh, some of the things, right? India created a world record by launching 106 104 satellites. satellites. 104 satellites in one go. In one go. So, for for an American company called as Planet. Okay. So, so we do have those capabilities. We have reliable solutions. We have cost competitive solutions. Uh, we have, you know, smart guys. Uh, we and we are also open, right? I mean, we. Uh, I mean, when we wanted to do the collaboration with uh, D, uh, with uh, Berlin Space Technologies, we had to get clearance from DLR for technology uh, exchange. It was easy, right? I mean, because we are India. You know, okay. we, we don't pose a threat to anybody. I mean. Uh, uh, except to our enemies, but uh, <laughs> we generally don't pose a threat to anybody. We like to peacefully coexist, and uh, what that has done is that's really opened up opportunities for us to work with different space agencies. And yeah, it's just for us okay. to now. When you interact with uh, other international space agencies, what is what are they usually looking for? Technology, cost, price. What is, See, or are they just treating you as equals and then having a sort of peer-to-peer -peer conversation? Yeah, it's usually peer-to-peer -peer conversation as equals, but uh, nobody can ignore the cost advantage that India offers. Right? India is really, really inexpensive if you want to build something. Right? Everything from real estate to manpower is inexpensive. But when it comes to actual production, right? Components. I mean, see, because it's a, it's a it's a it's a global supply chain. I mean, you could get components from Japan. So for example, some something that he's building uh, has only one uh, vendor in the world who's based out of Germany, and that's it. I mean, whether you like it or not, you need to buy it from them, okay. right? So the cost does not change uh, at at that level, at the technical level, mm -hmm. but everything else, right? The infrastructure, the people, uh, that is really ex inexpensive out here. So which is. Not a long-term uh, competitive advantage, of course. You know, we, our costs are also increasing, but it doesn't matter. I mean, today we still have that competitive. I want to touch upon the availability of space scientists and actually skilled manpower in space. Yes, we have had our space program uh, for 48 years now. Right. Right. And in 48 years, we've had thousands of uh, space scientists who've gone through the uh, ISRO, you know, organization. Right. right. Building stuff. They're all core tech guys. And there's a school, there's the Indian Space. Yes. There is IIST, which was actually founded by uh, ISRO. It's, a, it's an engineering school uh, you know, in Trivandrum, which trains people on space technology. But that's not it, right? While those kids come out, uh, you know, graduates of uh, space technology, and they can do stuff, the real value, the human capital that we have, is all these guys who pass through the ISRO system, right? They've been, I mean, 48 years, right? A lot of them have, have now retired, you know. They're all available uh, as mentors to work with, uh, you know, private companies, and they are working with private companies. They bring in a lot of experience in actually building stuff. In fact, so, we ourselves have around three mentors, ex ISRO guys, former ISRO uh, guys. So that that way, we have a really solid, uh, you know, manpower access. All right, got it. Talked about 104 satellites at the same time, right? Uh, how is this distributed or marketed, or are others companies? Uh, again, uh, others companies. If you want to launch a satellite and want to have some space there, do you pay something for that? Or, or? so see, when, there are two. I mean, when you have a rocket, right? You have the primary payload, which is a, one of the big satellites, and you also you always have a lot of space, extra space. It's like you're driving in a car. Uh, you're just occupying the front seat, but you have the back seat and the boot, mm. which is free, <laughs> right? Uh, it's just the two of you driving. Back seat and the boot is now available for anybody to kind of rent. Uh, right, uh, hitch a ride on, right? As as a as a secondary payload. Piggybacking. It's called piggybacking, right? Uh, it's available, and uh, ISRO, since they have a track record of uh, you know having the most reliable rocket and also cost effective, all these international companies that have satellites come to ISRO, 
and buy that land slot. Okay. And that's what you learn about, uh, you know, uh, on uh, tomorrow from uh, Dr. Shashi Bhushan. That is sold or just distilled? It's, I mean it's, uh, it's auctioned. See, it's a natural resource. It's both first come, first serve, as well as, uh, you know, whoever pays the highest, you know. Mm -hmm. All this while, it used to be first come, first serve, and there was something called as a paper uh, <coughs> satellite phenomena. So everybody who saw an opportunity, there's a, there's a, there's a slot out there, would just go, make a filing saying, I'll put a, uh, put a satellite and then, you know, sell it at a premium, mm -hmm. right? And ITU wanted to kind of stop that, and now, un until you have a satellite, uh, you know, you, which has passed multiple levels of, uh, you know, testing and clearance, you don't really get the allocation. So paper satellites became a big uh, controversy a few years ago. Mm -hmm. right. You know, what effect has the fact that India had a successful moon mission and then a successful mission to Mars? What has, th what has this done to India's confidence, sentiment, inspiration for the youth? See, India has always been confident of its own technologies, but the way the West started looking at India, the perception changed. Because we were the only country in the world to successfully go to Mars in the first go, in the first, very first attempt. Of course, we had a lot of learning from the failures of others, uh, but, you know, thankfully we didn't fail and we right. went there first. <laughs> and, and, we, and, and when we went to the moon, we went to the moon at such a low price point, it's unbelievable, right? Yeah, no, that was the Mars mission. Mars mission was seventy million dollars, I think. So, what? How much was the? Yeah, you may be having better numbers. Hundred, it's hundred million to direct uh, gravity. Hundred million to direct gravity. Uh, Seventy-five million to go to Mars. <laughs> That's it. You know, seventy-five million. You can be Mars. Right. Or if you can hire George Clooney and make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah.